Hey, it's Dr. Amanda with Straight Smile Solutions, straightsmilesolutions.com. And today, I just realized I did not have a video on the relationship between bedwetting in school age kids, airway, and orthodontics. And there is definitely published research on this. I believe I have some in my white papers section of my website. You can take a look there. Otherwise, you're welcome to email me if you want a copy of the white papers on this. Um, it is definitely not as much research as there should be, but basically this is the understanding. And this is something that when I was finally explained the relationship, I mean, I never had this on any of my medical or dental histories, nor would have I ever. I mean, I don't think there's really that many dentists office that ask about bedwetting, right? That's more of a pediatrician thing. And I don't know that that many pediatricians know that it could possibly have a dental related cause. There's a zillion different causes for bedwetting. Obviously, if you're going to talk to a pediatrician or a urologist, you're gonna get all different answers. Having gone through this with a with a close family member who was younger than me, um, we had a family member who had a severe case of bedwetting. And granted, this was a very long time ago. I was, you know, a new grad slash resident at the time it was occurring. And this um, this patient was school aged and, and this patient was struggling with bedwetting on a regular, almost nightly visit, um, had been to the best neurologists, uh, sorry, bad neurologists, the best um, urologists, nephrologists all over the town, basically the top in the country, mystery. They kept saying, you know, the patient's going to outgrow it. The patient's going to outgrow it. And the patient was getting close to nine and 10 and it wasn't outgrowing. I mean, the patient was almost like human, adult, male sized. This was not normal. And they had the electric underwear with the bells and the whistles and, and, and the fluid restrictions starting at 3 p.m. And having been close to this family member and, and had meals with this family member and spent evenings with this family member, I saw the toll it was taking not only on the family itself in terms of, no, you can't have any more water. No, you can't order juice with dinner. No, you can't have anything. You know, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. Nope, can't have anything to drink um, with dinner. I mean, that sounds almost like torture to me. Um, and then, you know, the, the parents weren't sleeping because the bells are going off all night long and the, and the patient's not waking up. Um, and what magically cured it, coincidentally to them, was orthodontics. And I never understood the relationship until after I started hearing about this. So let me explain how it works. And granted, if you have a child who is bedwetting or if you have a patient who is bedwetting, um, this doesn't mean this is the solution. This is just one of the solutions. But anytime now, it's on my SDB screening form, my sleep disorder breathing screening form, but you really wanna make sure that sometimes parents are embarrassed about it and, and sometimes parents always know, but you need to explain the why. Why, why are you asking this question? because it can definitely help um, improve the quality of the patient's life, definitely. So the adrenal glands are glands, you know, that are in our system, they're on top of our kidneys, and the adrenal glands are directly related to the quality and the quantity of sleep, not the quantity, but the quality of sleep. And I'm not a sleep physician, so I probably can't get into this, and someone who is can probably explain it more. But when you are not getting the right amount of oxygenation at night due to an airway issue, be it a constricted maxilla, tonsils, adenoids, mouth breathing, any of these habits that can occur in kids that can easily be fixed, you know, especially with orthodontics, um, a lot of times bedwetting can occur. And a lot of times when you do that arch expansion, when you do that paddle expansion, when you correct the mouth breathing, when you remove the instructions, sometimes you have to do all of the above. Sometimes this may involve a combination of orthodontics and tonsil and adenoid surgery. Sometimes you can just do orthodontics. So it needs to be an interdisciplinary approach, a tag team approach with multiple different providers. But a lot of times just if you see a lot of wear on the patients, like a lot of grinding, um, that's a red flag to me that there is an airway issue um, or a constricted maxilla or a posterior crossbite, um, or, you know, long growth of the face if you take a SAF. So anyways, yes, there is a correlation. You could only help your patients. So a lot of times if I'm on the borderline, you know, should we start this patient with phase one? Should we recall? Is it is it time to get started? Should we do an expander? Can we just do dental tipping? Can we just, um, you know, expand the arch? Or do we need actual skeletal expansion? I'm going to look into that SDB screening form, and bedwetting is definitely one of those red flags. And if I see them, yes, we're going to do palatal expansion. And yes, we're going to screen the tonsils and adenoids, do an OMT screening, look for other habits. And yes, we may have to re refer to OMT or yes, we may we have to refer to ENT, even if there's a one year wait or whatever. We're going to do our due diligence and make sure we make that referral and explain to the parents the why behind the whole this interdisciplinary approach 
to making the quality of life for this child better. And often other things can happen when the sleep improves, a lot of times attention improves, a lot of times just general behavior improves, a lot of other things can't make any promises, but it can usually only gets better. All right, thanks.